He was born in a log cabin in Kentucky. A hundred years earlier, Abraham Lincoln was born in the same community. His parents reported that when he was born, a light came out of the sky and came to the window and held over the little crib where they laid the newborn babe. That's the way God told his parents that he was a special child and had a great work for him to do in the future. This man is named William Brennan. He had been known as the prophet of the day. No one since or after him for a hundred years had had the miracles and the uniqueness of his gifts like William Branham. I'm Robert Slairdon, and this is God's Generals. William Branham is probably one of the most interesting personalities I've had the privilege of studying getting to know his family and those who worked with him during his life and his ministry. William Brennan was born in Kentucky about a hundred years after Abraham Lincoln had been born in a log cabin, just like Lincoln was born in a log cabin. And God used different means to communicate to the mountain people. Now, we, I'm a city guy. His family were mountain people, so I've always learned as a minister, God speaks to people in the ways they understand. And like I said in the introduction, when he was born, a light came out of the sky through the window and came over the crib where Branham had been laid after he was born. And that was the way God communicated to his family that this was a special child and that God had something great for him to do. Now, as he got a little bit older, the second time God began to visit him in a very audible and, and dramatic way was he was on his way to the well to get water. Remember, they're mountain people, not in modern times. And he was going with the bucket to get some water out of the well. And there was a wind in one tree. And God spoke out of the wind. We have a film clip here that we're going to show you now of William Branham telling the story of how God visited him as a little boy. I was born in eastern Kentucky in a little log cabin near Burtsville, Kentucky. The morning of my birth, I'm told of my parents that there was a light came into the room and hung over me. My people was not a religious people. They did not go to any church. Of course, this caused quite a stir among them. It's followed me all the days of my life. Recently, they took a picture of it in the scientific world, as shown here. You're probably familiar with this picture. It was proven by science that it was the only supernatural being that was ever scientifically photographed. To my opinion, it's the same angel of God that followed the children of Israel. At the age of seven, we moved from Kentucky to Indiana, up the road a bit from where we live now. We packed our water then from a well some city block, I suppose, behind the old country home. One beautiful September afternoon while coming from the pump with some water, it was a stately poplar tree stood about halfway between the pump and the home. Passing by there, there was a whirl of wind in the tree, what we call here a whirlwind. Why, it was nothing odd for that time of year in this part of the country. But it remained in the tree, it didn't leave. I stopped to see what it was. And a voice spoke from it saying, Do not ever smoke or drink or defile your body in any way, for there will be a work for you to do when you get older. Frightened? That's not a word for it. I ran home quickly, telling my mother that a man spoke to me out of a tree. Well, she thought I was nervous, she put me to bed. But from then on, visions begin to come. And when this comes up on me, it produces a vision. I'm able to tell people what's wrong with them and what they must do in life and the sins that they are holding back in their life. At the age of 37, one night I was praying in my room. And when I raised up, I noticed there was a light on the floor. And looking around to see where it come from, it was coming from above. The pillar of fire was hanging just above and was throwing the light on the floor. I heard someone walking. I looked coming through the room, coming into this light came a man and human figure, he'd be about 200 pounds of weight. 
He had dark hair to his shoulder, an olive complexion. He was barefooted. Of course, I was frightened. And he said to me, fear not. And as soon as I heard that voice, I knew it was the same voice that had always spoke to me. But the first time I'd ever seen him in human form. And he said, I'm sensing the presence of God to tell you that you're to pray for sick people. Great signs and wonders will be following your ministry and you'll be praying for kings and monarchs and so forth. Well, I told him I was a poor man. I had a, no education. I would not be able to do this job. He said as Moses was given two signs of confirmation of his ministry, that I would be given two signs. One would be the praying for the sick, the miracles, and the other would be, you know, the very secrets of the people's heart. I told him that I had been praying about this, that the people told me that it was of the devil, the ministry. He referred to me many scriptures, such as when Philip uh, found Nathaniel and Nathaniel came to Jesus. Why, well, Jesus told him where he had been, where he was under the tree when Nathaniel found him. And many other scriptures, such as the woman at the well, how that she was revealed, her sins to her. When Jesus told her that she had five husbands, she ran into the city and said, this is the Christ. Many other scriptures he referred to. I told him I would go. He gave me the assurance that he would be with me always. As Branham obeyed that uh, voice or God telling him what to do as a child, not to drink or to smoke, his father made fun of him, his brothers made fun of him, his friends made fun of him, but he stayed true to that voice. It made an impact on him. Sometimes you've got to do what God tells you to do, no matter what your family and friends around you say, because they don't understand. Don't be mad at them, but don't let their words or their attitudes affect your obeying what God told you to do. As he grew up into adulthood, he became a Baptist minister. His first wife and first child would also die, so he had a tragedy in his first life. He wanted to become a boxer, of all things. A nice little soft-spoken William Branham wanted to be a boxer, but every young man has his dreams and his goals, but God had a different dream. As he began to journey more in throughout his life, he became a, a game warden. He worked in the woods. He liked being outside among nature. That was kind of his personality. But in 1946, he was out doing his job and an angel came from the throne of God to tell him a message. That message was this. The angel appeared to him and he could see him eye to eye, like physical form as an open vision. The angel said, I've come from the throne of God to tell you that you've been given two gifts. The first gift is to know the secrets of men's hearts. And the second gift is to do signs and wonders to affirm or to confirm that what you say is from God. These two gifts were residential in Branham, where most other people's gifts flow through them at times. Branham's gifts were residential and lived inside of him at all times. That's why as he began to grow in his giftings, his phenomena was he was able to walk up to people know everything about their life, know their name, their wife's name, where they lived, what they did last night, what they had for dinner, what their problem was, and now you're healed, go home. That was typical William Branham ministry. Now, when we come back in a few minutes, I'm gonna tell you more of his story, but I wanna take a moment so you can see him operate in his supernatural gifts that God gave him. Because his story is phenomenal, his story has a sadness to it, his story has some very important life applications that we need to talk about. Before I begin to tell the, the complete story, I want you to see him operate in the gifts that God gave him. Now, to you who believe, the angel of God who has been sent to me to help you to believe Jesus Christ is not two foot from where I'm standing right now. If you believe me to be his servant, you'll take my word. I can't make you believe it. You only have to see, but he's here now at the platform. Now the Lord bless you while I talk to the woman. Everyone be in prayer. These are sick people. Now if this lady says that she is a stranger to me, I've never seen her in my life, no way at all of knowing her any way at all. Now I could not heal her no more than I could save her. And you know I couldn't do that. But Jesus Christ has already did all of that when he died at Calvary, but he sent gifts into his church. Is that right? It is say amen. amen. And the gifts are to what? Edify the church. Is that right? In other words, to see believers, unbelievers come in and say, truly, the Bible said, if you all speak with tongues and they're coming the unbelievers, well, they'll say you're mad. 
But if there be one prophesy and reveal the secrets of the heart, then won't that unbeliever fall down and say, truly, God is with you. Is that right? That's exactly right. All right, you believe now with all your heart that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is here now to perform and to do the things that he promised he would do. Lady, I just want to talk to you as, and the, the reason I'm doing this is to contact your spirit. Will you believe with all your heart? And if God will just reveal to me what is wrong with you, will you accept him as your healer? You would. Now, we are strangers, I suppose, are we? Never seen each other in life, nowhere. But God knows what's wrong with you, isn't that right? You're one of your greatest saints. You're anemic also. Isn't that right? You believe that God will make you well? Lord Jesus, I pray that you will heal the woman. Make her well, Father. May she go from here tonight and be made completely whole. In Jesus Christ's name I ask it. Amen. Now, go re re rejoicing. Pray. Now, that's according to your faith, sister. See, he never told me one thing, just said what was wrong with you. Watch what he said, see. What he tells you, that you do. Now, that's totally up to you, see. You believe it. You said you'd accept it. Now, he took it your word. You take him at his word. Go testify the same. You'll get well. Amen. Let's say, thanks be to God. Amen. I trust that God is blessing you all out there now to where you can't disbelieve any longer. It would be a, a, a sin for you to disbelieve now. After God has sent his son and has performed this thing that he speaks of now, and has done all these signs, and you have sent his Bible, sent his preachers, sent his gifts, and you still disbelieve him, there's nothing left for you but to be condemned at the end. Is that right? But the only thing this is to do is to glorify God and to reveal Jesus Christ. That when he was here on earth, he did this very same thing. All Bible readers believe that, say amen. And he said, when I go away, and I'll come again a little while, and the world will see me no more, that's the unbelievers, but ye shall see me, who? The believers. For I'll be with you, even in you, to the end of the world. Is that true? Then it's sin to disbelieve. Go ye and sin no more, or disbelieve no more, or a worse thing than this will come upon you, said Jesus. Is that true? Then we must believe. It's got to be a belief or perish. If I was God, if they could take my word for it, that would settle it. But people still don't take the word, then signs and wonders are added into the church as Jesus Christ promised to do. And to my honest belief, I believe he's finishing up right now with the Gentiles and will turn to the Jews right away. And the Gentiles will be left in their dogmas and the things that they've got, their creeds and cold formal denominations, and the church will be raptured and tucked up, and the gospel will go to the Jews. Amen. Amen means so be it. All right. Excuse me, sister. I have to relax my mind. Now we are be strangers. I see that you are strictly a stranger to me. You're from away from here. You come from another city. You've got a lot of trouble on your heart. you got hard trouble to begin with. Is that right? There's a whole lot of blackness. I see a black sheep keep following you like that. Oh, it's a lie. Somebody told a lie on you. And that was a man was professing divine healing. Yes, sir. He said you was a witch. Is that true? And it, you've got a whole stir in your church or something other about it. Isn't that right? Your pastor's sitting right now. He's got polio. Is that right? Sister, don't pay no attention to what them people tell you. They're alive. And the only thing's wrong with your heart is that nervous condition got your heart worked up. Go on home in peace, and God bless you. You're all right. God bless you. You're not alone. You believe with all your heart? Believe God will heal you that people. Believe he'll make you well without asking. Lord Jesus, I pray that you'll heal the woman, and may she get completely whole. I ask this blessing in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Go on your road rejoicing, saying, thank you, Lord, and you'll get well. Come, lady. Almighty God, author of life, Give this woman her perfect health in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.
God bless you. Just a minute. Something happened to you. You know that. You're aware of that. Is that right? Why, it's all over the building. And every person here could be healed right now if you'd believe it. You believe this? Have faith in God. Are you one of the ushers, sir? All right, sir. That lady sitting right there. Got heart trouble. That speckled dress on. Stand up, lady. He just healed you. They had that heart trouble. You believe that with all your heart? All right. There sits a lady there with her handkerchief up crying. Just had a lick on the head the other day. She's got a headache. It's called it. Is that right? Stand up and accept your healing in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. How many of the rest of you want to accept your healing? Jesus Christ is right here now to heal you. Do you believe that? All that wants to be healed, stand to your feet right now. Every person in the building that wants to be healed, stand to your feet. Raise up your hands like this to God. Almighty God, the author of life, the giver of every good gift, as our spirit is here tonight, I pray that you'll heal every person in this building. Thou art here, the Holy Spirit is here. And I now, as your servant, along with these other servants, curse every disease in here. May the Jesus Christ, the Son of God, heal every person in here. Satan, leave these people in Jesus Christ's name. Now that the people have got their hands up, say praise God and go to rejoice in God. He was a Baptist minister, and he was driving down the road one day, and he saw a tent meeting, kind of like the one we're in today, probably a little bit larger than this one. It was an afternoon, and so they drove up and got out of his car and went into the tent meeting, and here's how they picked the preacher for the afternoon meeting. That afternoon meeting, they want to let the youngest preacher in the tent preach the afternoon meeting. So they went around, how many are preachers here? And everybody raised their hand that were preachers, and how old are you, and how old are you? And, you know, Brenham raised his hand, and... He happened to be the youngest preacher in the tent that afternoon, and they let him preach. Can you imagine having your guest speaker in the afternoon meeting just drive up, get out of the car, and then he ends up preaching? Well, he was among a group of people called Jesus Only. They were a group of Pentecostals that did not believe in the Trinity. They didn't believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. They just believed there was only one, and that was Jesus. And so he stood up to preach, and these Pentecostals discerned as he began to flow and begin to speak that there was something special about this young preacher that afternoon. After he got done preaching, they talked with him and befriended him and began to have him preach in their services. And he began to operate in his gift by knowing people's secrets and saying things to them privately as he walked into the tent or after the tent or sometimes in the middle of the altar service, he would say things to people. And these Pentecostals picked up like, whoa, there's something unique about this. And it was around this group of people that he began to develop his public gift about knowing the secrets of men's hearts and doing signs and wonders. And when this began to happen in a very strong way, these people begin to say, you got to come and see this man. So he goes to Arkansas and there's a young man named Gordon Lindsay that's invited to come and see this prophet, this man that has an unusual gift. Now, Gordon Lindsay was not a oneness person. He was a Trinitarian, but he was friends with everybody. That was one of his great gifts, one of his great personalities, that he could be friends with anybody. And so he goes there and sees Brenham operate in calling out people's diseases and names and addresses and phone numbers, and they'd get healed. And so after the meeting, William Brenham and him got together and talked, and they felt a click. They became good friends. And Brenham said, would you become my business manager of my ministry? And Gordon Lindsay said, Sure, I'll do that. And Gordon Lindsay was the organized and the administrative type of person. And William Branham, let me just be honest with you. He, he was not educated very much beyond like the second or third grade. He didn't understand all the administrative things. He just wanted to be nice and talk to people and flow in his gifts and go home and be with his family. So Gordon Lindsay and him build this relationship. He starts organizing the, the church meetings and advertising them and renting the convention centers when they outgrew the churches. And so this began to grow and to explode. And so Gordon Lindsay also would do this in the Branham campaigns because William Branham really wasn't a great preacher. I've interviewed many people that would be in Branham's meetings and they would sleep while he was preaching. And when he was operating in his gift, they'd all wake up and watch what would happen. There's no two Holy Spirits or and that same Holy led Simeon that night or that morning, Christ has led you here tonight because you believe the promise of the Holy Spirit. And he's just as obligated to you as he was to Simeon. The same because he's done and he has to keep his word. 
Then I can see for Simeon. He craved, he desired to see the Christ. He believed what the Word of God had said to him, no matter what the critics said. He believed the Word of God. There was a yearning in his heart to see the Christ, and he believed he would. As David said, when the deep calleth to the deep. Many of you in here believe in divine healing. Do you? You believe in divine healing. The very reason that you believe in divine healing proves there is a divine healing. In the beginning days of the Brenham campaigns, Gordon Lindsay would teach in the afternoon uh, the Word and, and, and teach people how to get healed and keep their healing. And sometimes uh, William Brennan would let Gordon Lindsay preach the sermon at night, and then Brennan would come up and just do the miracle line. And so that's how it began. And so there was a great camaraderie between these two. Uh, Gordon Lindsay was the Word guy, Brennan was a spirit guy. And so them together made a great team together. Now what happened was, as Branham would begin to minister, he would go sometimes two or three o'clock at night, praying for each person individually, like, like you saw in the clip. Well, if you do that every night, or two or three o'clock at night, eventually you'll get exhausted. Long story short here, he comes in one day and tells Gordon Lindsay, I'm done. I'm finished. I'm leaving the ministry. I can't do this anymore. And he walks out and leaves Gordon Lindsay with all these contracts of auditoriums that have been booked. The magazine that he now had prepared and begin to send out to all the thousands of followers of Brother Branham. He had all that done. He thought, what am I going to do? <laughs> the prophet has left. The minister is gone. I've got these magazine subscriptions. I've got these auditoriums I can't cancel or I lose all this money. And so at this moment, there was a great revival that we call the Voice of Healing Revival. And what Gordon Lindsay did, why Brandon went back to Indiana to rest and recuperate, thinking he's never coming back into ministry again, Lindsay calls different preachers, Jack Coe, R. R. Vineyard, different healing evangelists in to pick up these meetings that he had booked in these auditoriums and begin to hold Voice of Healing conventions and change the name of the magazine for Brenham to the Voice of Healing magazine. So that's how the revival began to pull all the other ministers together. It was when Branham decided, I can't do this anymore, and he walked out. At the height of this revival, we have over 150 different healing evangelists that would work with the Gordon Lindsay Ministries and the magazine to help propagate their books or tapes or campaigns. And so that did not end Gordon Lindsay's life. It kind of made it into, go into a bigger uh, influence in the nation. After a period of time, Branham decided that he had recuperated and he wanted to come back. So he came back to Gordon Lindsay and said, well, uh, will you come back and be my business manager? And Gordon Lindsay goes, no, I won't do that because he was kind of scared that uh, Brandon may just leave him again. So he said, why don't you just join what we're doing and be a part of the big, the big picture. And Brandon humbly and respectfully joined the big picture, even though he stood out above everybody else with his gifts and his abilities. And so Branham continued to preach and do his campaigns, but the relationship between Lindsay and Branham was broken. And this was one of the great mistakes that happened in the Branham life. Branham and Lindsay was able to work together in talking about the Word, keeping things in order, doctrinal error did not come in, because Lindsay was a Word man, Branham was a flow in the Holy Ghost man, and that together keep the right balance. When this relationship was broken, then there was a problem. And then Branham began to have false doctrines come in, begin to have different things. Now, some people have got angry at me because I talk about this. So let me tell you my motive. The reason why we talk about Brother Branham and the mistakes he made toward the end of his life is not to be judgmental, but so that we today can learn what was right and what was wrong. Here's a great prophet with a gift that we've not seen like it in many, many years, probably hundreds of years, to be honest with you, but yet, he began to make an error because he lost his divine relationship with Gordon Lindsay. Number two, he tried to change offices at will. He was a prophet. He was not a Bible teacher. And then he wanted to become a teacher. Stay where God put you. Don't change offices at will. I beg you. That's one of the big mistakes people make in ministry. I want to do this. I want to do that. Do what God called you and anointed you to do and be happy with that. That's where the joy will be, the fruit will be, and the blessing will be. Brother Branham, begin to preach things like this so you'll understand the gravity of it. He began to say, when you see a coffin or a hearse or a casket, it's a woman's fault. And the, what he believed by that was because even the garden had bit the apple and caused the whole problem, so he blamed all the women for that. Well, that's not true, but that shows you his simplicity, how 
uh, off he went in doctrines. He began to say that uh, denominationalism was the mark of the beast, and these are just a few things that begin to come out of him. Well, Brother Branham died in a car wreck in Texas. He was hit by a drunk driver, and they went through the windshield and came back, and the great prophet went to be with the Lord. It's a sad thing, but I do think that maybe the Lord took him before he could go into worse error and cause more trouble in the body of Christ. If I'm wrong, I'm, I'm sorry, but I do think that's what happened. I think Brenham went to heaven. I think there's a lot we can learn from Brenham. And I hope that you'll spend more time listening to the good parts of Brenham and being aware of the bad parts of Brenham. There are people today that are called the Brennanites and they do everything that revolve around Brenham. They'll go to church instead of having a preacher preach, they just play William Brenham tapes. I'm sorry, I don't think that's quite the way it should be done. I think you should hear a good preacher preach. You go listen to Brenham tapes in your own personal time. That's great, but he can't pastor you when he's been gone since the 1960s. I hope that you will order my book, God's Generals, because I can't tell you everything in this 30 minutes about William Branham, and there's so many good things to tell, and there are so many good things to learn from. I love the man. I value the man. I appreciate the man. So the number on your screen, or go to my website, and you'll be able to order the God's Generals book and all the other information I have about William Brennan and all the other great evangelists. I hope that you will not be afraid to do all that God's called you to do. Learn from people's mistakes where you don't have to repeat them in your own life. Thank you.